Are you in Numbers chapter 19? Well, did you know that after seven years, did you know seven years ago, on Monday, August the 21st, there was a complete solar eclipse that came in from Lincoln City, Oregon, in the northwest, and went all the way across the nations and and exited at uh, Charleston, South Carolina, if you will. Whoop. You go tomorrow, there's one, right? Everybody knows that. Um, Tomorrow, seven years later, another total eclipse of the sun will be seen in America. It will begin in San Antonio, Texas, southwest, and will cross upwards to Bathurst, Maine. Seven years ago, tomorrow, a total solar eclipse will be noted by the people of these United States, and it will form an X. Seven years apart, two eclipses will form an X on America. In Jewish understanding, solar eclipses are a sign. That's from Genesis 1, verse 14. You thought the sun and the moon were only, you know, for whatever. Did you know that God says, I put them there as the best time-keeping apparatus in the universe? He did. And he said also, oh, by the way, do you know that there are over 290 moons in our solar system? Uh, That pig planet Saturn has all kinds of them, over 70. Earth has only one. And of all the 200-some moons and suns and planets, only Earth's moon is on what's called the ecliptic or the approximate pathway of the sun across the sky. Only our moon can eclipse our sun and the shadow of our planet can eclipse the moon's surface. We're the only one. Fascinating. By accident? I don't think so. In Jewish understanding, solar eclipses are a sign, says Genesis 1 verse 14, to the nations. Who's the nations? Well, non-Jewish nations. But the lunar eclipses, when the shadow of the earth falls across the face of the moon, that's a sign to Israel. Did you know that X is also a Jewish letter? It's the letter Tav. It's the last letter. Aleph is the first. Tau is the last. We would say A to Z. There's an X being drawn right across our nation tomorrow, and if you will, it is the Jewish letter Tav, the last letter in the Jewish alphabet. Does that mean anything? I don't know. (laughs) Would you say, however, that it is significant? In case case if you're wondering at home, um, um, the X happens most effectively in the small little town of Macanda, Illinois, population 547. What's up, Macanda? Last Friday, you might have noticed, a 4.8 Richter scale earthquake rocked New Jersey and was felt in New York City. And the New Yorkers were pretty upset about that. (laughs) I'll tell you what, you know, when the ground shakes, everybody's pretty cool until the ground's shaking underneath them. I don't think it's a stretch to recognize, if you kind of go to the history of this nation and what is imported into Uh, New York, the harbor there at New York, and I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to sort of sense that New York City, if you will, for many hundreds of years, well, last couple hundred years, as kind of the gateway to America. I don't know about you, but that makes sense to me. The gateway. There was an earthquake, you guys, at the gates of the city of this nation. Have you heard about wars and rumors of wars? Have you heard about the bird flu destroying tens of millions of chickens? Did you know that the bird flu uh, virus has now been seen in cattle and is spreading there? Unprecedented cicada swarms are about to hatch in the Midwest. Have you heard about that? Cicadas are like this big, if you've ever seen one. (laughs) This big. (laughs) And everybody's saying it's the craziest thing because cicadas in their life cycle, they will be sort of in that... uh, that, uh, that state of, of rest or hibernation for many, many years. And then suddenly, weird, all the entomologists are saying, it's so weird, we are going to have a bumper crop of, crop of cicadas this spring. Have you noticed weird weather? Have you noticed signs in the heaven? <laughs> More on that in a minute. 
And also, have you noticed that our U.S. president is now putting considerable pressure on Israel? Did you know that? And you know what pressure he's under. We got that election cycle coming up, you know, and a whole lot of people saying, you know, dude, we want you to do it. Please don't ever forget Zechariah chapter 12, verse 3. The Bible says in the very last days, Jerusalem will become a burdensome stone to all nations. Would you describe Jerusalem a burdensome stone to everyone? Well, except the Jews. That's, that's the thing. Also, um, Zechariah 12, 3 goes on to say, and if anyone tries to heave it out or try to mess with Israel's sovereignty, that God will hold them responsible. Woe, it says, to anyone who lifts it. Sometime, and also there's something else coming. This is what I want to talk about this morning. Sometime between Passover this year, April 22nd, uh, and Pentecost, which will be May 19th, you may hear of another extraordinary, huge event. And what is it? It's the red heifer ceremony in Israel that may take place on the Mount of Olives within the next month and a half. Is that significant? How many of you know what a red heifer is? Kenny Green would say, a red heifer is delicious. That's what a red heifer is. <laughs> red heifers, of course, um, genetically speaking, it's a bit of a rarity. And so that's why I have you here in Numbers 19. I'm going to show you what the Bible says about that. But I want to go on because there's more to the story. If there were a red heifer ceremony in Israel on the Mount of Olives in the next couple of weeks, would that be significant? Um, I want to show you how it's quite significant to a lot of people. Are you ready, Chris? Go ahead. You guys remember that on October the 7th of, this, of last year, Hamas terrorists invaded southern Israel and they killed more than 1,200 Jewish people, including 38 children and three babies under one year of age. They kidnapped more than 200. A hundred days later, this fella here, this is Hamas spokesman Abu Abadeh, He's marking the 100th day of the war of Gaza with a video, and that's him. And he said, among other things, there he outlined the motives for the massacre, including, quote, or I should say accusing the Jews of, quote, bringing red cows to the Holy Land. He said it. Here I go, button. This is Rabbi Yitzhak Mamo, and he is the head of an organization called Bonet, or Building Israel. He works, or his organization is nonprofit, and he works in um, concert with another group called the Temple Mount Institute. If you've been with us here at Harvest a number of years, we've talked a lot about the Temple Mount Institute. Well, what is it? Starting many, many years ago, they believe that the third temple that Messiah himself will dedicate is the third temple prophesied in the book of Ezekiel, Chapters 40 to the end, and they would be correct. It's coming. What do you mean the third temple? Moses was instructed by the Lord to make a tabernacle or a tent. When they get into the land under David, his son Solomon builds, increases all of the measurements, but builds that tabernacle from a tent to a magnificent structure. Absolutely stunning structure. That was the first temple. And in that temple, Israel, now in the land of promise, that's when they begin to, I should say, continue their temple sacrifices, rites, and rituals. That first temple was destroyed um, by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. And for the next 70 years, the Jews were exiled in Babylon. And by the way, all of that is prophesied in your Old Testament, much of it, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Oh no, said the Jews, what a tragedy. A foreign governor has come into our land and destroyed our city and destroyed our temple. God knew that day was coming, but they didn't listen. He sent Jeremiah and Ezekiel to tell them. They wouldn't listen. Seventy years in exile in Babylon, they come back under Ezra and Nehemiah. You can read about it in those books. They build a kind of a modest temple, and the old guys say, that's nothing like Solomon's temple. Fast forward the film, 
And you're going to get to King Herod the Great. And uh, he then takes on this smallish, humble sort of structure. And he greatly expands it into the magnificent temple of Herod. That's the temple that Jesus visited. That temple is regard, largely regarded as the second temple. You remember on Palm Sunday, if you were with us a couple weeks ago, Jesus presented himself on the day that Daniel said he would be there, 173,880 days to the day that Daniel said he was going to be there. He's on the Mount of Olives. Is that significant? When they were in ex exile in Babylon, Ezekiel from Babylon in the spirit seized to Jerusalem. He sees the glory of the Lord come out of the east gate or out of the, the, the door facing east, come through the east gate, go across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives, and then ascend right out of sight. The glory of the Lord had departed the temple. Jesus on Palm Sunday is standing on what mountain? The Mount of Olives, effectively offering all of Israel how about the glory of the Lord has returned and it's me, God, who zipped up a human suit for you. For a minute, it looked like it was going to be very successful, but you know what happens. Jesus stops the whole parade and he weeps. What? Jesus, why are you weeping? This is a huge party for you. We've got palm branches going. We've got coats of laying down. We're singing the Hallel, Psalm 118. Blessed is he, Messiah, who comes in the name of the Lord, Jehovah. It's you. Even the Pharisees were saying, Jesus, rebuke your disciples. Why? Because they were saying out loud in chorus that Jesus is Messiah. Thank you, Pharisees and Sadducees, because we non-Jews, if we miss the significance of why they say that, whoop, goes over our head, it was not lost on the Pharisees and Sadducees. He is so not Messiah. Well, Jesus stops that whole parade, you remember? And he weeps. Oh, Jerusalem. Quiet, quiet, he's going to say something. Shh, shh, what are you saying, Jesus? Would you like a Kleenex? Oh, Jerusalem, if only you knew what day this was, singular, day. But because you missed it, the Romans are going to come and they're going to lay a siege wall around these magnificent walls and they're going to lay siege to this city and the entire city is going to be destroyed. Not one stone left upon another. And you missed it. Well, we covered that in Palm Sunday a couple weeks ago. If that's interesting to you, get our, get our tape on it. We've got it. It's available online. But then uh, blindness in part goes on to Israel, as we talked about. And then he proceeds down the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley, and into the East Gate. And instead of kicking out Romans and beginning the millennial reign of Messiah that they were all expecting, he turns over the tables and he says, look at the merchandising going on in God's house. I won't have it. And as a nation, Israel went, ew, you're not our Messiah. And four days later, on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, he is crucified and killed. But then he resurrects. He hangs with the disciples for the next 40 days, and then he goes across the Kidron Valley, and then he ascends. You remember that story? What a day that should have been. I wish somebody would have had a cell phone then. That would have been great to see. He ascends. He ascended from what geographical location on the planet? The Mount of... Do you see the significance? Once again, because of Israel, the nation of Israel's unbelief, the glory of the Lord leaves from the Mount of Olives. Zechariah chapter 14 says when Messiah does come back, Zechariah is an Old Testament prophet. Um, it would be familiar to the Jews when Messiah comes back to the planet, the Bible specifies his foot will land in a specific location. Can you imagine where he's going to land? Where does Zechariah say Messiah will touch down? On the Mount of Olives. All that with a backdrop. What's up with the red cows? This is Rabbi Yitzhak Memu, and he works with the Temple Mount Institute, 
And what is the Temple Mount Institute? For the last several decades, they've been building and recreating from Old Testament descriptions all of the elements of the third temple. See, right now, according to Judaism, when you sin, you're supposed to take an animal, all prescribed in your Old Testament law, and you're to take it to the temple, and there at the east gate, because there's only one way in, that's the east gate, you place your hands on the animal, symbolically all of your sin transfers, and then they sacrifice, pardon me, they sacrifice that animal on the brazen altar. What are Jews doing now to atone for their sin? There's no temple. There's only one place on the planet they can. There's no temple. Do they want a third temple? Now, if you take a kind of a, a, a census of the people of Jerusalem, we know from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 27, that when they come back into the land in 1948, they will be largely secular. They'll go through the motions of their ethnicity, so... They will observe their calendar, rites and rituals, feasts and festivals. But what is missing from the very center of biblical Judaism? A temple. Now, we know that Jesus fulfilled every model that the Old Testament did or was. Measurements, colors, fabrics, metallurgy. Every inch of the tabernacle of Moses is a model of what Jesus Christ would do. In fact, there's the, 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 here's the temple. It's divided into two rooms, the holy place and the holy of holies. And just outside, there's your brazen altar. Um, there's your lavert. Go inside. And then to your right is the table of showbread. To your left is the golden lampstand. Right ahead is the golden altar of incense. There's the veil. And behind that, there is your Ark of the Covenant. Is it me or do you see this inside the actual temple itself? A bit of a cross. It all is figurative and models Jesus Christ. It was on purpose that God allowed the temple to be destroyed. Why? Because you don't need a temple anymore. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Does everybody see that? But in Israel, in 1948, when they come back, God knew that. And in Ezekiel chapter 27, God promises that they will come back at first secular. They'll go through the motions, but there's going to come a time when the Ruach of God, the breath of God, will come into the nation and then all of Israel will be saved. Well, when is that? We covered that last week if you'd like to get that tape. Likely the midpoint of the Great Tribulation. So that is the background. What is the big deal with red cows. This is Rabbi Yitzhak Memu. They have recreated every single stitch, every single element, every single... Uh, the priests were identified by mitochondria DNA. And even right now in Israel, according to Rabbi Memu, there are nine specific priests who are not born in a hospital and were watched their entire life from birth to this time who are... Levitically pure, nine of them who could do this red heifer ritual. What is the red heifer ritual? Glad you asked. <laughs> this is Rabbi Yitzhak Mimo, and he says, These red heifers can bring world peace. The Bible teaches us that the key for building the third temple, which is the house of prayer for all nations, is purifying us with the red heifer. In Jerusalem. Go ahead. At first there were five of them. By the way, the Temple Mount Institute and B'nai Israel, they've been looking for red heifers for a very, very long time. Every once in a while, one is born because they, they, they have to be born in a certain manner. There can be no punctures or piercings, you know, and, uh, and they have to be entirely red. If they find two non-red hairs Anywhere, the animal is disqualified. It has to be a certain age. Well, they've been trying, and for many years, they tried to uh, grow one there in Israel, but never could succeed. Uh, uh, Rabbi Memu was contacted by a fella who lives in Texas who knew a guy who knew a guy who was raising red heifers in Texas. And he invited the rabbi to come and see if he could find any. Now, you have to think with me. 
This red heifer has to be perfect. No punctures, no nothing. In America, when a calf is born, almost immediately their ears are pierced for tagging. You know that. But remember what was happening in 19, 2019 and 20, you had COVID. Everything was locked down. And for the space of you know, several months, veterans, veterinarians couldn't get into the fields to pierce the cow's ears. So happens that this particular rancher had several red heifers. None of their ears were pierced. Very unusual. Rabbis found five perfect red heifers. Go ahead. The problem is the international laws in Israel specifically, you can't just bring livestock into your country because they don't want to introduce, of course, um, any kind of disease system that would decimate uh, the local livestock. So it's in the law. You you can't bring in uh, cattle from another nation. But Israel tried and tried to do so domestically and couldn't. And they found a loophole in the law. You can bring a pet So American Airlines helped them package and create safely five pets. And the pets entered Israel in September of the year 2022. Go ahead. Uh, This is Texas, and this is on the farm. This is one of the rabbis inspecting what was then a very small little red heifer. And they found five. Go ahead. Now they are somewhere in near the uh, city, what's called Shiloh, which is amazing to me. If you know, if you can remember your first kings, Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, where did the Ark of the Covenant rest for 369 years before David took it to the city of Jerusalem? It resided in the city of Shiloh. This is Shiloh. And uh, it's a little tricky because this is also the West Bank. Shiloh is about 17 miles north, northeast of Jerusalem. But here is a, is a farm. It's secluded. Nobody really knows where it is. Well, I shouldn't say that. Some people do. Uh, now the, f- the two of them have developed, I don't know, one or two hairs that aren't acceptable. So currently there are three red heifers in Shiloh right now. Go ahead. And they're approaching a little over three years. And um, let's leave that one up. And are you in um, Numbers chapter 19? What's up with the red heifer? Numbers 19 is Moses. This is part of the Pentateuch. Uh, This is 1500-ish BC. It is what God said regarding the red heifer we're going to see. In the next 10 centuries, go ahead. You got to see this too. Now, here is Rabbi Yitzhak Memu. Where he is standing, he is standing on the Mount of Olives. He is standing on one quarter of an acre on the Mount of Olives. So, you need to know that that is no small task. Uh, For the longest of time, much of this land was owned by non-Jews. In 1948, uh, they come into the land, but they still couldn't have Jerusalem. They win Jerusalem in the Six Days War when Israel is about to be attacked by several Um, Islamic nations. They repulse that attack, and seven days later, they push into Jerusalem, and now the Jews have uh, political authority over Jerusalem. You see over his shoulder, that's the Dome of the Rock. That is on the Temple Mount. That is the traditional, and I use the word traditional, and if I had flying air quotes, I would use them too. That is the traditional location of where Solomon's and Herod's temple stood. One of these days, I'm going to take you through an interesting exercise that that is very likely not where it was, but let's just hold it there for today. Rabbi Yitzhak Memu is standing on one quarter of an acre that B'nai Israel purchased 12 years ago. It is the only place on the Mount of Olives that is, so to speak, not internationally challenged. That's important. Go ahead to our next slide. There's this quarter of an acre. Sorry, it's blurry. It's the best one I could get. That is the only place that is owned by someone who is uh, working with and alongside the Temple Mount Institution. And standing there, you look west, and that's what you see. You're looking across the Kidron Valley, and you see the Golden Dome of the Rock. That's the traditional place where the Temple of Solomon and Herod stood, and that's where the East Gate would be. 
One of these days I'm going to show you that more and more archaeology is coming to bear that it was actually to the south. Oh, I've got to show you this. Go to your next one. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are called the Torah. It's also in some places called the Tanakh, which would include some of the prophets as well. But uh, you have in your lap what God told Moses to write down. The Jews, on the other hand, what they did was, is they had oral traditions from their rabbis, and they said, well, let us expound more on what God says. So, the Mishnah is the writing down of what used to be the oral traditions. From 520, pardon me, B.C. to 780 A.D., teachings by noted rabbis were passed down orally. These traditions, especially regarding the Sabbath, became more and more complicated. Jesus finally had to say, you have heard A, B, C, but I say to you, the traditions of the rabbis began to overtake the actual word of God. Rabbinical tradition. Rabbinical tradition. Well, after the Jews were scattered by the Romans in 70 AD, they figured they better write these oral traditions down, and so they did. And they began to be written down and consolidated. The very first Mishnahs, or the Bible plus all of the commentary, appeared around 200 in AD, and there are several of them. Over the years, more teachings and traditions were added, even more so. And they fell into two main sort of teachings, and those two main collections of Mishnahs, plus more, are called Talmuds. And they were debated and finally settled upon, and then you get this. Go ahead. This is the Jerusalem Talmud. It began about 400 A.D., but as you can imagine, it's grown bigger since. But that is the Talmud, which includes the Mishnah, and that 21-volume set is the Bible plus all of the traditions of the rabbis. Much of what goes on in Israel regarding their ethnicity and the, and the very delicate and detailed portions of the law, many of them are not directly in the Bible, but they come from this the Talmud, and the Mishnah. Uh, go ahead. There's another major Talmud. It's called the Babylonian Talmud. Um, when Cyrus the Great gives the decree to let the people go from Babylon, many people, many Jewish people do. But many Jewish people stay behind. And a large Jewish population thrives in the region. And I believe direct intellectual descendants of Daniel himself those guys are likely who the wise men who were that came to Israel because they were watching uh, the stars and the signs and they were counting the days of the book of Daniel. Very likely that's who they were. But there's your Babylonian Talmud. All right. Can we finally get to Numbers 19, please, Steve? Yes, we can. Are you ready to dive in? Most of what you're going to hear in the next couple of weeks regarding the red heifer don't come from um, nine, chapter 19. They come from the Talmud and the Mishnah. Let's see what God's word says about red heifers. Are you ready? Chapter 19, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, here's another legal requirement commanded by the Lord. This is interesting. This one about the red heifers was not from Mount Sinai. It's not with the original Ten Commandments at all. This is about two years later. Fascinating. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer. For those of us um, um, challenged in the ways of animal husbandry, this would be a girl cow. So think of her with a little bow on her head. A perfect animal that has no defects. As everything in the Old Testament, is this a model? It sure is. What color was that cow supposed to be? Red. And it was supposed to be without any defects, if you will, sinless. And never has a yoke been yoked to a plow. This is an idea. It is young. Never yoked, likely a reference to youth, speaks of innocence. Red, likely a reference to blood. Together they speak of innocent blood. Can you think of a model that the red heifers may be about? Jesus, verse 3, now give it to Eliezer. Eliezer was Aaron's son at the time. Aaron was the high priest and Eliezer was not. 
the, um, if you kill anything and come in contact with anything dead, you are ceremonially unclean. So Aaron is to remain ceremonially unclean, but Eliezer is to do this particular act. Eliezer the priest, and it will be taken outside of the camp. You can circle that or highlight it. That's all it says. <laughs> but I'm going to show you here a little bit. You get the, by the time the Talmud and the Mishnah get a hold of it, it's page after page after page after page after page. But notice here, it simply says, God says, take it outside of the camp and slaughtered in his, Eliezer's presence. Verse 4, Eliezer will take some of its blood on his finger and sprinkle it seven times toward the front of the tabernacle. The front of the tabernacle faced east, so you would be facing west and sprinkle logically somewhere toward the gate area. So you are west of the tabernacle or the temple, and you are sprinkling eastward. Pardon me, you are sprinkling westward, and you are looking at the temple facing eastward. The front of the tabernacle always faced east, and when Israel was in Jerusalem, what is the mountain east of the Temple Mount? Mount of Olives. But the Mishnah won't leave that alone. The Mishnah goes on and says all kinds. I won't go into it all, but some of it is actually quite fascinating. Mishnah para or book or section number three, verse two says, some children were born and sequestered in the city of Shiloh. Same place. Very important, they had to be born of a certain way and manner and they could never have touched anything dead and they were raised to keep them from any possible manner of touching anything dead. In a minute, when the Bible says, I want you to take some fresh water, the Mishnah says, you take those kids that are now a certain age and all their life, they've never touched anything dead, they're the only ones who can scoop the stone cups of water from uh, either the Pool of Siloam or the Gihon Springs. And then it says on a big, big ox, put a door on the ox, put the kid on the door. And he, none of that is in the Bible. But for them, it's pretty important stuff. Anyway, they could use these stone cups. Why stone? Because stone does not conduct or carry uncleanness. To ride upon ceremonially clean oxen, you know, oi. They bring up water from the Gihon Springs or the Pool of Siloam and they mix it with ashes of the red heifer. And because they didn't want anybody to touch anything dead, during the time when a red heifer was required, found first because they're rare, and then uh, this ritual, then the Jews would build a bridge over the Kidron Valley. Let me show you. Go ahead. Here is uh, the Temple Mount today. Go, here's some identifiers. There is the Kidron Valley to the bottom. There's the Dome of the Rock. That was built by the Islamics about 700 AD. They believe that that is the place where the piece of rock from the bedrock protrudes through the platform. And they believe that's where Muhammad stopped and his horse Barak then zips him up to heaven for his revelation. So the Dome of the Rock is not a mosque, it's a shrine commemorating that. But to the left is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, or the farthest mosque, and over the top there's the Wailing Wall. Go ahead. Here we go. There it is. You are now looking north. I hit the go button. Here's our identifiers. There's the Dome of the Rock. There's the Al-Aqsa Mosque. There's the Wailing Wall below. Uh, we've talked about that. That's the last portion which the Jews believe. The, the Romans got tired of kicking over rocks, and so they just stopped and that last little portion, really under the pavement, under the level of the pavement, they believe are the last remaining stones of the temple of Herod. It's called the Wailing Wall because, why are they wailing? Because they're wailing for their temple, the third temple. Now, just for reasoning, I want you to notice the space of land in between the Dome of the Rock to the north and the El-Aqsa Mosque to the south. Someday I will show you that uh, very likely it could be the Jews have been praying right toward what used to be the location of the Holy of Holies. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Well, we won't do that today. Um, but I want you to see the Mount of Olives to the top. Uh, go ahead. Here is an artist's rendition of what the Temple Mount looked like in Jesus' day. It's absolutely fascinating. 
Uh, hit our go button. That is the Kidron Valley, and that is likely where, when it was time to do the red heifer, they would build a bridge. And um, the uh, Mishnah gives all kinds of specifications, but that bridge was called the Bridge of the Red Heifer. It went from the east gate of the temple in Solomon's time and in Herod's time and moved across the Kidron Valley. Now, why would it have to be arches? Because that whole area is now uh, graves. And so they would build these arched uh, bridgeway across so that the, the whole red heifer offering uh, process, all of the priests involved and the kids with their, on the door of the, uh, sitting on a door that's sitting on a cow, etc. Nobody would even be remotely possibly touching a grave. So that was called the bridge of the red heifer. Go ahead. Here's the artist's rendition of it. Now, I don't know that it looked like that because if that is the summit of the actual Mount of Olives, that bridge would have to be, oh, basically 2,000 cubits, which is 3,000 feet. I don't know if that particular artist's rendition is accurate, but it gives you an idea that when they were going to do the red heifer, it had to be, according to the Mishnah, on the Mount of Olives. Okay, and then they would look across, and it was stipulated, you have to look across. You had to see over the east wall and into the Holy of Holies. That's what the Mishnah says. But I don't know if it looked exactly like that. I hit the go button. My hunch is it looks something like this. There's actual a view of the southern portion of the old city of Jerusalem. Hit the go button. Across that little ravine is about 600 feet my hunch is it's a little bit left in that thicket of, of uh, trees. I don't know that you have to go all the way to the top of the Mount of Olives, but I want you to notice that if there is some sort of structure of any kind going across the Kidron Valley or just somebody on the Mount of Olives on that little one quarter acre spot doing red heifer stuff, back to Numbers 19. We are now at verse 5. Oh, I got to read you this too. Today, the Jews believe that the ashes of the red heifer, or the red heifer, there's only been 10. This is fascinating. According to the Mishnah, there's only been 10 red heifers ever found, ever located. Moses had one, and then it names who the other ones were. By the total of, by the time 70 AD comes around, they figure that the ninth red heifer had already been used up. The ashes of that sacrifice, and that ceremony had been used up 70 AD. That was red heifer in the history of Israel, number nine. Then you start reading through, and you're going to find out that uh, there was another guy by the name of Memonides. He's got an acronym and a t-shirt called Rambam. I'm not sure exactly how that works out, but he is very influential in modern day Judaism to this day. He lived about 100 to 1200 AD. He said this, he said that the tenth and final red heifer will be overseeing the, the ceremony. The tenth red heifer will be overseen by the Messiah himself. That's what the Mishnah says. The Jewish people are very excited about their Mishnahs and their Talmuds. So they are looking for a red heifer. And when three of them, wrote, five of them rolled off of American Airlines in September of 2022, they were very excited. Now there are three that still remain rabbinically viable. And the Temple Mount Foundation and B'nai Israel have not given a date, but it is their hope that the age of these three remaining red heifers will soon age out and they have to do something between Passover of this year and Pentecost. If you see on the news a ceremonial red heifer, maybe it's on the Mount of Olives, I don't know. Does that mean that, what does it mean? Let's keep reading. In 2018, Rabbi Chaim Rickman, the director of the Temple Mount Institute, said this. This is before they found the Texas Red Angus. Rabbi Reichman said, if there has been no red heifer for the past 2,000 years, perhaps it is because the time was not right. 
Israel was far from being ready. But now, what could it mean for the times we live in to have the means for purification so close at hand? With the words of Maimonides, Ram Bam, in mind, we cannot help but wonder and pray if there is now no red heifers, if there is a red heifer, pardon me, is ours the era that will need him? Whew. Now let's zoom quickly to the end. Numbers. Verse 5. So anyway, you find this red heifer, you give it to Eliezer. He's the one that's going to do this. The Bible does not say Mount of Olives, but the Mishnah does. Who knows where it will be. As Eliezer watches the heifer, watches, the heifer must be burned. It's hide, meat, blood, and dung. Eliezer the priest must then take a stick of cedar, a hyssop branch. Remember in the Passover, God tells Moses, you take a branch of hyssop, you put it in the blood, and you put it on the doorpost and the lintel. You remember that? That's how it was painted on. Fast forward the film, Jesus on the cross was offered some gall or some sour wine, and nobody was a theologian, but the Bible happens to mention they raised it up on what kind of a pole? Hyssop pole. So you've got to have some hyssop, a branch, and some scarlet yarn, and throw them into the fire where the heifer is burning. And in my mind, that totally played out on the cross. What kind of branch was offered to Jesus? Hyssop. What color was Jesus' blood pouring out? Scarlet. Was the cross possibly made of cypress? Was Jesus burned, if you will, judged? He sure was. Verse 7. Then the priest must wash his clothes, bathe himself in water. Afterward, he may return to the camp, though, though he will remain ceremonially unclean until evening. That's ill he is there. Verse 8. The man who burns the animal must also wash his clothes and bathe himself in water. He too will remain unclean until evening. Then someone who is ceremonially clean will gather up the ashes of the heifer and deposit them into, in a purified place outside the camp. Again, where was Jesus crucified? Outside the camp. One of these days I'm going to show you a startling understanding of where the crucifixion might have actually been. Everybody knows it's called the skull, Calvary, duh. Um, Gordon's Calvary is the traditional site. It's a limestone face and some things have been hollowed out and it kind of looks like a skull. Could be. I don't think so. One of these days I'm going to show you what I believe the term skull and counting skulls is all about. And I'm going to make a case, what I believe is compelling, that Jesus was crucified on the Mount of Olives. But let's keep reading. Oh, and by the way, when he died and said, Father, it is finished, and into me your hands I give your spirit, a shriek happens, and the Bible says that the veil in the Holy of Holies was ripped from top to bottom. How did they know? I submit because they were standing on the Mount of Olives, look right over the east wall and look right into the actual Holy of Holies. And I believe that those on Calvary's cross, the skull, really the counting of the skulls, I believe they could see it straight in. But I digress. Let's finish, please. They will be kept there for the community of Israel <coughs> to use in the water purification ceremony. So one heifer, if done correctly, and they would sift out all the bigger chunks that weren't burned completely, it was estimated that there could be millions and millions of individual sort of, you, you put some of the ashes into this purified water, running water, and then one red heifer could keep you in purification ashes for quite some time. This ceremony is performed for the removal of sin. <clears throat> The land and the instruments <clears throat> and the priests of the third temple. If there's going to be a third temple, do you understand that that all has to be sanctified? And there's only one way to sanctify the land, the materials, the instruments, and the priests themselves. Before there can be a third temple, there has to be the ceremony of the red heifer. Why do you think the Hamas guy was so losing his mind about red cows entering Israel? And most of you probably did not know that Hamas, one of the reasons they went in and did what they did 
to try to spark a holy war is because they knew that the Jews had some red heifers. For what purpose? To ceremonially complete Numbers 19, have red heifer ashes, sprinkle it on and purify the ground, the priests and the implements for the third temple. By the way, does Daniel tell us about a third temple that the Antichrist himself will get, will allow the Jews to build? Yes. And doesn't the Bible also stipulate that that Antichrist at first lets the Jews do their temple oblations? We have been doing so since 70 AD. Three and a half years he goes into that temple and he desecrates it and puts a statue of himself in the Holy of Holies. But those three years in front before he does that, all of Israel, hails that man as Messiah. And if Messiah has at his disposable, at his disposable, at his disposal, a whole bunch of urns of red heifer ashes, would the priests, given the political green light, could they then sanctify the land and all the implements that the Temple Mount Institute has already built and could the, a functioning temple tabernacle be up and functioning within hours? Yes, but not until there are red heifers and a red heifer ceremony. Let's keep reading. Almost done. Verse 10. The man who gathers up the ashes of the heifer must, go, must also wash his clothes, and he will remain ceremonially unclean until evening. This is a permanent law for the people of Israel and for any foreigners who live among them. Verse 11. All those who touch a dead human body will be ceremonially unclean for seven days. They must purify themselves on the third and the seventh day with water of purification. That is your red heifer juice. Sorry, that's a terrible term. But that's your red heifer. That is your ashes in that purified water. What also is in those ashes? Cedar ashes, red scarlet ashes, and hyssop ashes. That whole fluid is needed for purification. Then they will be purified. But if they do not, but if they do not do this on the third or seventh day, they will continue to be unclean even after seven day, the seventh day. Verse 13. All those who touch a dead body and do not purify themselves in the proper way defile the Lord's tabernacle. They will be cut off from the, from the community of Israel. Since the water of purification, read that red heifer juice, was not sprinkled on them, their defilement continues. Verse 14. This is the ritual law that applies when someone dies inside a tent. All those who enter the tent... And those who were inside when death occurred will be ceremonially unclean for seven days. Any open container in the tent that was not covered with a lid is also defiled. And if someone in an open field touches a corpse or someone who was killed with a sword or who died of a natural death or if someone touches a human bone or a grave, that person will be defiled for seven days and is only um, reversed by the Red heifer juice. Verse 17, to remove the defilement, put some of the ashes from the burnt purification offering, red heifer, in a jar and pour fresh water over them. Then someone who is ceremonially clean must take the hyssop branch, dip it into the water. That person must sprinkle the water on the tent, on all the furnishings in the tent, and on the people who are in the tent. Also on the person who touched a human bone or touch someone who was killed or who killed, who died naturally, or touch the grave. On the third and seventh days, the person who is ceremonially clean must sprinkle the water on those who are defiled. Then on the seventh day, the people cleansed must wash their clothes, bathe themselves, and that evening they will be cleansed for defilement. If you will, spiritually, stay away from dead things. <laughs> Amen? And before we sort of cluck our tongue and say, isn't that funny? Does any of this principally speak to believers as well? How are we cleansed? By the blood of the lamb. But there's something that the Bible says, now notice every time you touch something dead, it's going to get on you. Go to the water of the word, so to speak, 
Ask to be ask to be washed again by the blood of the lamb, and then you will be clean. If you will, spiritually speaking, harvest. Watch out and stay away from dead stuff, okay? What do you mean? Movies? Video games? Music? Remember, garbage in is always going to equal what? Garbage out. Verse 20. But those who become defiled and do not purify themselves with the red fluid will be cut off from the community. For they have defiled the sanctuary of the Lord since the water of purification was not sprinkled on them. So they didn't get any red heifer stuff on them. They remain defiled. You see how this is all a model of Jesus Christ? If you have the red fluid, the innocent blood of the lamb, you are cleansed. But if you don't, you remain defiled. Verse 21. This is a permanent law for the people. Those who sprinkle the water of purification must afterward wash their clothes. And anyone who then touches the water used for purification will remain defiled until evening. Finally, verse 22. Anything and anyone that a defiled person touches will be ceremonially unclean until evening. Now you know why they took such exhaustive measures to stay unclean from the little kids born to do that job all the way to the priests. And currently in Israel right now, there are nine human priests who fit this description. What happens to anyone touching dead things? The Bible says you got you to get you got to be disconnected. All right. So, the model of the red heifer, the model of the red heifer is be careful of dead things. It'll get on you. So, tomorrow, a total solar eclipse will be completing an X across America. Earthquakes at America's city gate, so to speak, last week. Unprecedented numbers of cicadas soon to arrive. Wars and rumors of wars, and our own president pressuring Israel. Zechariah 12, verse 3. Woe to anyone who does that. Weird weather. Oh, one more thing. Let's all stand. You've been sitting a while. I got one more thing for you. If you happen to be standing in one of the regions of total eclipse, did you know that if you have really, really good eyes and if you are in the total, what's the name of the zone if you are totally eclipsed? It's called the, the what? The total zone. I, that's what I thought it was. Totality. totality zone. All right. It just came to me. Totality. If you're in the totality zone from Texas all the way through Maine, and if you have very good eyes, you know what you might see? You might see this. Go ahead. What is that? That is Comet 12P Pons Brooks Comet. That's what that is. Do you know what else it's called? Go ahead. It's called the Devil's Comet. It's going to show up and it's going to cruise across our skies from about uh, this time until June. An X has been marked across America. X is the Hebrew last word in the alphabet. And by the way, signs in the heaven, there may be a devil's comet hanging around. Oh, by goodness. Would you join me in prayer? Let's dim our lights. Red heifer, huh? Well, I'll tell you what, it sure spooked the Hamas people. And one of the most horrific, diabolical attacks on humankind, let alone the Jews, was because there were some zealots who knew the significance of what the red heifer could mean. If there is a red heifer ceremony, if it is acceptable to the rabbi, then the Jews will have jars and jars of red heifer ashes that when and if the new temple does get the green light, they will have the red juice, the red heifer juice to cleanse the land, to cleanse the elements, to cleanse the priests of the third temple. 
harvest are we gathering and seeing how close the potential return of Jesus Christ could be? So Lord God, with everybody's head down and eyes closed, I pray, Lord God, that first of all, we don't freak out. Jesus, you said, when you see these things, do not freak out, but look up. Make sure you are loving the people that God has given you. Are you truly born again? Are you wasting time on endeavors that eternity won't even be remembered? Are you holding on to bitterness and unforgiveness? Are you nursing and rehearsing slights and wounds and harsh words? Are you? The red heifer ceremony, if you see it, don't freak out. It doesn't mean the tabernacle or the temple is within days. It just means that the priests will have the means of purifying the temple, ground, etc. But my, oh my, there has not been a red heifer in almost 2,000 years. And now there's three of them in Shiloh. Are you born again? Have you given your heart and life to Jesus Christ? Now would be a good time to do so. In Jesus' name, and now all of us said, Amen. 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 <laughs>